Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. No matter where it is that you're joining us from, the the, the advantage of being of having COVID, I guess if there are any advantages, <laughs> uh, is that we could easily join each other virtually now more than ever before, right? Zero excuses. Uh, so wherever it is that you're joining us from, thank you for carving out time to, to join this distinguished group of panelists. Uh, we have about an hour and a half. We have 90 minutes uh, dedicated to a topic that uh, it's not only relevant to the times, but relevant and to all to all the panelists in here. And in one way or the other, uh, it, it's part of our lives because we all happen to be Latinos, Hispanos, and we care about our community. And I hope that uh, if you join today, uh, you were driven by the interest to either learn more insights about the Hispanic, U.S. Hispanic cohort, and some of the cultural and ethnic, uh, the cultural nuances and, co and ethnic terminology that applies to this segment. So before we get, before we get into a, the dialogue, I start this dialogue, um, I do want to uh, highlight to everybody in this call that we will be discussing uh, some cultural sensitive matters. And in that respect, uh, I'd like to remind all of us to be respectful, to be mindful, to listen, to seek to understand the other's perspectives, and you know we're not here to uh, to create consensus. We're here to actually listen to different perspectives, and hopefully we can come out more educated from this experience with each other. Ultimately, we have to remember that we have all reached our conclusions, on no matter what topic it is. Right? We all reach our conclusions, and we all form on our thoughts in an honest approach. Right? We don't we don't just wake up and build opinions just for the sake of being mean. We, we've all reached our opinions and our thoughts in an honest way. So uh, with that being said, I'd like to create a little bit of what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, I'm going to kick this off by creating a little bit of context of how we got into this panel. And then I'm going to go through each of the single panel, uh, each of the panelists and introduce them one by one. And they're going to, they have different, uh, uh, different sections of the slide where they're going to address them for. And I'll ask each of the panelists to spend, you know, three to five minutes uh, in this first round so that after this first round, then we can continue into all the topics. You know, by popular demand, by popular demand, I think the first topic that we're going to enter is the topic of the term Latinx. A lot of folks uh, gave us uh, uh, their feedback that they were interested in seeing the data and insights of this terminology. And I think we're going to start with that. We're going to spend probably 20 minutes on that. And then we're going to pivot into further uh, Hispanic insights, whether it's cultural, in the marketplace, and in the future of the Hispanic uh, of population. So the first thing that you should know is that this journey started with uh, the Board of Assembles really question, you know, talking about a brand, uh, refreshing the brand. And, and just, you know, I'm going to go real quickly through this, maybe five minutes. If anybody wants a full report, I'll give it to them at the end of, the, of this webinar. Ask me, the, it's a 40-page report, so that's why we're not going to go through 40 pages right now. Are, are you glad that we're not going to do 40 pages of, of PowerPoint right now? <laughs> I hope you are. Um, so we, we, we started with wanting, after 32 years of being an organization, we wanted to understand and, and, and potentially rebrand ourselves. And we thought about, well, should we include the word Hispanic? Should we include the word Latino? Should we include the word Latinx? We were not sure. So we, we turn around to survey our members and to evaluate the collective sentiment of our members. As we were going through this process, the Hispanic, Hispanic Corporate Council of Atlanta, the HCCA, which is a consortium of 43 BERGs in Atlanta, several ERGs were asking the same questions. So we, we, between the ACCA and the CEMOS, we reached out to Hispanic executive, which they happen to have a sociologist or staff, and we um, built a survey that we could give to both of our organizations and try to uh, get some insights on the collective sentiment of this. So that's a little bit of the context, right? Uh, it's always important to understand these cohorts in, in, in its multifaceted uh, colors, because at the end of the day, the Latino Hispanic population in the U.S. has grown significantly, right? If you look at the trends right now, uh, we are the fastest growing minority cohort in the U.S. Uh, outpacing the, the black community, outpacing the Asian community, 
Frankly, I'm placing all others. Everybody else, uh, be, only the Asians and Hispanics seem to be growing. Everybody else is flat or declining. Here's another way to look at that illustration. And, and this is only to point out at a high level, right, the relevance more than ever of the Hispanic segment when it comes to business, when it comes to marketers, when it comes to anybody trying to connect to this community, because this is, this is how America is changing today and it's going it's to continue to change demographically in the future. As you think about an executive summary of the survey that we did to our 18, 1,600 SMOs members and our 511 ACCA members who responded, at a high level, what you need to remember is that when they, when, they, when, they, when they were asked about their preferred terms, Hispanic came to be on top as their preferred term, Latino came to be on second on top, and less than 2% two, less than 2 resonated with the term Latinx. It's also important to point out that about 50% of the, of, of, of the respondents did not feel offended if they were misidentified with one of these terms. And about 25% have really had a 50-50 mixed feelings about how they feel if they were misidentified. As we were thinking about some of the reflections of what this means, uh, you know, uh, we, we thought that it was interesting to see that 82% remain, had a proclivity to remain neutral when it comes to this. Uh, and we found it's also very important to find out that our cohorts of survey was, was limited to professionals. And and ultimately, the goal right, was to help us try to think about how to refresh our brand and how to connect meaningfully with our members and also help marketers and businesses connect to that segment. As we continue to research this topic, we find out that our, our, our survey, when they give us uh, their feedback, there were a lot of strong emotions on both sides, uh, people that were for some terms, people that were against some terms. And at the end of the day, it was, it was a very, very insightful gathering of data that I'll be happy to share with any of you. Uh, email me afterwards, and I'll send you the PDF so that you look at some of the commentary that was shared by the participants. From an ACCA perspective, if you look at it, this is the high level. Uh, I'm not going to get granular on this data, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how this split was in terms of, uh, of the participants. And actually, from an assembly perspective, it was basically the data was around the same thing. Now, uh, I did, we were able to find one more study uh, that was done back in 2018 by this organization called We're All Humans, uh, where there were about 212 different uh, professionals, Latino professionals. And you could see that when they were asked whether they preferred to be called Latino or Hispanic, uh, if, if it mattered to them, the great majority, 68%, said that it didn't matter. Uh, whether they were called Hispanic or Latino. And then when you added the term Latinx to it, it still showed that the great majority preferred to be called Hispanic or Latino. Uh, we actually went online to find out more data on this topic, to find out, you know, we, we, we were able to find a lot of opinions and uh, a, a lot of uh, carefully thought out opinions on, on, on this topic, but we, it was hard to find out data on it. So. One of the articles that I was able to find out, one of the studies that I was able to find out, came from Think Now Research. And their CEO, Mario Carrasco, is here with us. And, um, you know, I bump into one of his articles that was actually picked up by the New York Times, the Washington Post, by Fortune Magazine. This was something that was published, uh, I think it was back in October of 2019, Mario, is that correct? And, and it was around the context of uh, several of the Democratic candidates in their campaign were using the term Latinx. And you, your, your team decided to do research on this and uh, cue that. So why don't you run us a little bit through some of the findings uh, on that research? So you mentioned, um, by the way, my name is Mario Carrasco, co-founder of Think Now. We specialize in uh, multicultural research. Um, Hispanic, African American, and Asians in the U.S., and of course, large portion of our business focused on U.S. Hispanics. And so, when we first did the the study that Giovanni mentioned in 2019, we've actually done two studies. That was the first one, um, and it was really something driven by a client need. We were asked by the NBA about this, um, and that's when we decided to actually do some research. Um, about, you know, what do Latinos in the U.S. prefer 
um, how do they prefer to describe themselves? So very similar to the work that Asemos did. Uh, however, the sample is very different, right? Ours was a nationwide representative survey of 508 U.S. Hispanics. So we weighted it by the four census regions, the nine subregions, by income, by education. Um, so you have a you know much more representative sample than 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 the previous study. Um, and the 2019 study got way bigger than we had expected. Um, you know, like. Ivani mentioned, got picked up by the New York Times, Washington Post, wasn't our intent. We really, we publish content on a regular basis. So if you go to thinkingout.com, we have um, studies ranging from auto purchase intent to CPG. Um, so this was another one of those studies and we had no idea that um, it, would, it would resonate so broadly and be picked up by the press. Um, and so what we found um, in 2019 was really similar to um, what Asemos had found, can we go back to the previous slide, please, Giovanni? Um, what yep, we found was that, um, you know, Hispanic was by far the most preferred term how Hispanics in the U.S. would like to be um, referred to, um, then followed by Latino, Latina, um, country of origin. Um, and then you go down to Latinx, there's about 2% overall. This study, because it was picked up so widely, um, got picked apart online. Um, and so while everything in this sample um, was weighted and representative like all of our other studies, because it got um, such you know large attention, we actually decided to do a follow-up study um, in 2020. Um, and we doubled the base size. And we got some criticism that I was actually valid. You know, one of the the criticisms that we um, internalized and then wanted to do again was to make sure um, that we had a readable base size of um, of respondents um, that that identified um, as well as as Latinx and also that identified as um, as, a, as either gay lesbian or, or non-binary um, so we made sure to include uh, a base size um, that over index uh, in, in reference to the population. And even when we redid that in, in uh, January of 2020, we saw almost the same exact result, um, which made us feel good from a, from a research perspective, right? That we had set up the sample frame correctly um, and the study was consistent with an entirely new batch of respondents. Um, and again, Hispanic was preferred overall with Latino and Latina coming in in second. Um, and then again, Latinx at 2%. Um, and you would expect that as you go into perhaps younger generational cohorts like millennial, Gen Z, um, there would be an increase uh, for Latinx in terms of preference. And um, the research actually didn't, didn't bear that out. Um, so you can see here um, across the board, you know, the highest that it got was 3%. So among 18 to 24 year olds, um, the preference for Latinx was at 3%. Um, not much change um, in terms of income. Um, and this graph is a little bit misleading. It looks like big sweeps, but you're looking at um, the x-axis here from zero to 3%, right? So that skew that you're seeing is from 1% to 3%. So 3% being the highest preference. Um, and there's actually no statistical significance here um, in terms of, of, of difference. So we thought um, that was really interesting and we wanted to publish this um, to give best practices to um, companies, of course. We primarily work with Fortune 1000s. Um, we also work with government agencies, CDC, US Army, um, and uh, political campaigns when they're reaching out to Hispanics, you know, to reach out to them and, and, and uh, identify them in terms that they prefer. Um, and so while, you know, Latinx may be um, something that's gaining steam um, right now, looking at the U.S. Hispanic market, it really isn't a term that's, that's gotten above um, 3% uh, preference. Um, and again, and then we, we also dug into um, on the second study um, how they felt, how, how Latinos in the U.S. felt about um, the term. And, and again, pretty similar to to the the SMOS um, research than that they don't necessarily um, find it offensive um, 
they're they're for the most part uh, fine with fine with the term, um, but uh, you know some don't like the term very much, um, and and uh, so Hispanic is really again kind of the top in terms of of, of what Hispanics in the U.S. like to be how they like to be referred to. Well, thank you, thank you, Mario, for giving that. I mean, one of one of the things that I that we as we were researching this further, right, we stumble upon this graphic where we see when when the the hashtag Latinx researching for Latinx uh, peaked, and I think it's important to mention this that you know it was a term that was originally started back in 2004, and and then in, in June 2016 it peaked in Google searches and. And that was the time during the Orlando, Orlando, Florida mass shooting in Club Pulse, right? Most of the, the clients of Club Pulse were our, 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 our brothers, uh, LGBTQ Latinos in there. And that's where the hashtag Latinx came out to, uh, you know, peak during the Google search. So as I was, as I, as I bump into this, into this uh, Google search, I, I wanted to, to reach out to the friends that I knew at Google. And this is where I came into Julissa. Uh, Julissa and I are both uh, uh, were awarded the recognition of being part of the hi hi Hispanic Corporate Council of Responsibility uh, under the Young Latino Stars, which of our companies picked us. AT&T picked me, Google picked her, and I was like, well, let me reach out to her. Also, she knows she's very, um, uh, very entrenched in the community. She also runs a, a nonprofit uh, called Listas in the in the in the in the in the Bay Area. And she's also very much like very involved, like myself, in the Hispanic ERG within Google. So, Julissa, um, can you give us a little bit of context on how uh, Ola, how Google is 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 embracing uh, all this different terminology? How are you guys wrestling with this topic? Yeah, I think similar to all of you, especially you, Giovanni, we are looking at how do we name certain councils or how do we name certain things within internally events even. Um, and the reality is that the reason why we have decided, or at least speaking for myself, the term Latinx is because the term Latinx was born out of a space of inclusion. Whether you identify with it, and I, and I understand the data, only 2% of people identify with Latinx. I myself identify as Latina. Um, but when I say uh, the Latina, you know, Google network, or when I say the Latino Google network, there is still, even if it's 2% of our population, a small subset that's being, that feels excluded. So I think there is a understanding of how do we, I think, how do we create or use a term that is all inclusive, right? Um, at Google, at least from my experience, and also we were looking at this when I worked at Intel, um, I do think that uh, we are adopting that term of Latinx more so than going towards Latino or Hispanic. Now, the, the OLA, is that an acronym for anything? OLA well, used to be an acronym when it started. <laughs> my my Google assistant is talking. <laughs> 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 Um, no, OLA used to be an acronym when the organization started, um, but as we decided to let go of any acronyms and just let it be a welcoming word, OLA. Interesting. How did you, how did you, can you give us some insight as to how you guys arrived to that conclusion? Um, because the original um, OLA included Hispanic, um, it just felt like it was excluding our Brazilian population um, and our other non-Spanish speaking, um, yeah, Latino population. So it just became too complicated. And we were like, well, OLA is such a great word. Now we will say though that even within OLA, we are having issues where you don't say OLA in Portuguese per se. So even that word uh -huh. OLA is exclusive in some ways. And we are thinking of ways to address that in the future. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it's that's interesting that you guys pivot into away from an acronym and into just a word. Um, you know, Asemos has been for 32 years has been uh, an, or, an organization, and it was never Asemos was never an acronym. But in prior iterations, there were 
acronyms that were, that were used by the organization. And I'm kind of glad that we landed with a word, right, ASEMOS, which it translates to we do. And as I, as, I get, as I engage all the different ERGs and they ask me for advice, that's the advice that I gave them. It's like, you know, step away from ethnic terminology and stick to a word that could be as the most inclusive and representative as possible of your members. So that, that might be some really good advice uh, for this audience over here as they think about engaging and rebranding themselves as, an, as a BERG. So thank, thank you so much, Elisa, for, for providing those insights. Um, so a, a, another person that I wanted to bring into this conversation was my friend David Perez, who David is the Senior Director of Donor Relations at the Hispanic Federation. Uh, uh, David uh, is also part of the Latinx Institute and he has invited to he has invited me personally to several of his events and i've seen uh uh the the term latinx used very often in all the terms that he's a part of and i figure he will be a perfect person to bring into this panel and to give us uh context and and perspective uh, uh from his world hey david welcome thank you for having me appreciate it um well as you mentioned um i think I think along with with Julissa's lines, like in terms of inclusion, is kind of where you know um, I feel like the conversation is. I come more for the nonprofit sector, so not as much as the business uh, perspective. But um, I volunteer with Union Equals Force at Latinx Institute, and Hispanic Federation has been a partner supporting that as well. So we started around 2013, just bringing a space together of LGBTQ Latinx people, and you know when we started, we used. Latino, Latina, like with the aroba, right? At the end with the at symbol. So for me, when I was in college, I know a lot of the Latino student groups had the, the at symbol or the aroba to try to have an inclusion of men and women. Um, that seems to me not really to take off online a lot. <laughs> I know that other books were then published trying to be inclusive of Latino and Latina men and women and use Latino slash Latina. So O slash A. So again, you know, it was kind of an idea of inclusion. Um, I would say since 2014 is when our institute started using the word Latinx. They started a hashtag Latinx Improved. When we met in Denver, Colorado. And that was our intersectionality committee, which was tasked with having more inclusion in our movement. Um, so basically from then we kind of changed our name to the Latinx Institute, you know, permanently putting the X there. So, um, I think it's so in English, like a lot of folks will say Latinx, a lot of folks, you know, speaking Spanish will use an E instead of an A or O, right? So I think depending, for me, language is like about who you're communicating with and being inclusive. So I think it always depends who you're speaking to and in what context. And so for us, since we're there with uh, many non-binary folks, transgender folks who would say, could you please speak in this way to be inclusive of us? And we're like, sure. Of course, we're down for that. Of course, we'd like to signal that we're going to um, do that. Um, you know, I've always worked at Latino civil rights organization since about 2007. So we always use Hispanic, Latino interchangeably and put a note at the bottom of the report or the, the release, right? Because, you know, maybe in New Mexico, my grandmother's from Albuquerque. So she used the Hispanic a lot. I grew up in Southern California. I use Latino a lot, you know, so I think there's a lot of folks that like different things and being inclusive, you know, as possible. Um, but it all depends, I feel like, in the moment who you're talking to and not saying like someone has to use the word Latinx to describe themselves. But sometimes in the nonprofit leadership role, you can't signal, we want to be inclusive, we hear you and we see you. And, and uh, help us clarify, because one of the things that I found out in our survey was that there was the, the participants, the 2,000 participants of the survey, mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of confusion of what the term Latinx stands for. Can you provide this audience a definition of it? I mean, I think the main idea is to be a gender neutral term. So for example, you know, in Spanish, I might be a Latino male or there might be a Latina woman. Um, so as I think Mario mentioned earlier, some folks identify as, you know, uh, gender nonconforming. So they might use they, them pronouns instead of he or she pronouns. So Latinx is a way to not say you have to be in a binary gender one way. You know, you can be inclusive of folks. Also, I think from the a feminist perspective, so all the words aren't ending in, in O, a male, you know, kind of 
way. Um, also, some folks, again, in Spanish will use the E, the letter E instead as well. And, and um, uh, so one of the, one of the uh, feedbacks that we got in this question was, well, like, okay, so if this is about gender neutrality, what about using terms like Latin or Hispanic? Are they not neutral in the English language? Well, I think with Hispanic, you go back to Julissa's um, situation where, depending who you're talking about, it's, you know, Spanish speaking, you know, Latin America, right? Uh, you know, you have those issues with Latino, Hispanic. Um, I mean, is a gender neutral term? All I know is growing up in California, Mexican American, Chicano movement, like, you know, Latin, Hispanic. I mean, most people I grew up with wouldn't prefer those terms, but I don't have great research like marketers in y'all. Yeah, well, it, it, it gave, it's frankly, it gave me flashback of my college days. In my mm -hmm. college days, you know, 1999, 2003, the great debate back there was, are you Hispanic or are you Latino, right? And I think Julissa even mentioned this. And, and I just remember there were very passionate uh, dialogues and opinions being shared by both, by both sides. And, and, you know, uh, you know and, and, and I was taking it all in, and frankly, until I was challenged <laughs> to, to be like, hey, which one are you? I, I, I didn't even thought about it. I was like, you know what? My, my spirit of the whole thing was like, you know, call me whatever you want, Hispanic or Latino, but just call me with the opportunity, right? That was for me, that was more essential for me, right? Like, call me whatever, <laughs> but just like, show me whatever box you want to check. I'll check it, but just give me the opportunity to move forward as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an individual, you know? So thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. Right, Lisa. I just wanted to say that there is a difference between Hispanic and Latino. The term Hispanic is a term that was for people living in the United States to speak Spanish. And that was a government term created. Whereas Latino is a term that is from Latin American, people that are from Latino American countries. But there is a difference. So when you identify as Hispanic and you're a Spanish speaking person, for example, someone from Spain can be Hispanic, but from, from someone from Spain can't be Latino. Friends. And then when you go and say, are you Latin? Then technically someone from Spain can be Latin because they speak a Latin language, um, a Latin based language. And also, I also want to provide that for the X, X is also used as a, um, what are they called? Like a variable letter. So it could be anything, O, A, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gotcha. Thank you so much. I think that's the. I couldn't. I couldn't have coordinated that better. That's a perfect transition to our last panelist. Not you know, our Ricardo Gonzalez continues to be a guest, a welcome guest uh, back into our Semos uh, webinars. Uh, he has been with us uh, before. Actually, he he came to our national ERG conference about two three years ago, and he gave us a, a very impactful webinar on his the six stages of cultural mastery. He's the owner and founder of Bilingual America, and Ricardo, I think you also own speakspanish.com is that what it is speakspanish.com yes speakspanish our, next, our, ne our next one will be spanish for hispanics.com that's that's the one now, I, I, now we have to change it to spanish for latinx.com right so um, we'll see where we go with that you know culture changes it shifts so well i thought it was very important to include you in this conversation of ricardo because indeed right language is a cultural phenomenon how do you, um, how would you, I, I happen to know that you're a linguist as well, right? Besides being a CEO and an author, you happen to be a linguist. Can you give us some insight in, in the actual, you know, technical li linguistics of the terms? Sure. So it's called a neologism, right? Which is coming from neo, new, and logos, word. So basically it means a new word. And it's a new word that has not been accepted fully into the mainstream, okay? And that's why you're seeing now this 2%, okay? Which if you were to get on forums, I think it's, it's fascinating to me because I look at things from a cultural standpoint primarily. That's, that's really my life work. If we were to be having the same exact conversation in Latin America, for example, we would be doing this in Spanish. And very frankly, I, I live in Latin America and, and so, it's just not a conversation. This is a conversation that is predominantly among uh, Spanish speakers or even people of Hispanic descent uh, in the United mm -hmm. States. And, and so it's a very different conversation, 
right? The reality is, for example, just to give him some further context, maybe some more international context here, Giovanni, um, the, what is called RAE, which is Real Academia Española, which is kind of the governing body over the Spanish language, came out with their latest style guides, and they were very clear that they would not accept Latinx as a term uh, within, within the Spanish language. So that's the international context out there. The other part of that is that 38% of all people in the world, their first language is a gender-based language. So it's not just Spanish. It's also Italian, it's Russian, it's German. There are many other languages that are gender-based. And so we have to ask the question as, um, I'll, I'll just say, hispanohablantes, because that's actually the correct term if we were speaking in Spanish, right? O hispanoparlantes. Um, whether or not this is something that is specifically germane to our group of people, or if this is something we are also wanting then to take to other languages and how that would play culturally in those languages. I, I don't think it's just a conversation about language. It's a, it's a and it's been already said, this is really a conversation about inclusion. And are we excluding people by using a certain term? And I think there's a great level of sensitivity right now within the American culture to be as inclusive as possible. And so I think that that's really a cultural discussion and not a language discussion. They kind of go hand in hand. Hmm. Let, the, I, I wanna follow up with this and then I'll, I'll stop here. There are five elements of every culture, okay? And so if these five elements are not in existence, then there's not a culture. But one of the elements of every culture is language. So if we begin to shift language and how we use it, in other words, for example, if we degendered the Spanish language, for example, at the very same time, we are actually making a great cultural shift. And I think that those are the bigger, more macro issues that have to be considered in this conversation. And Ricardo, I have, that, that's a, you positioned it so well within kind of a global framework. And I'm curious, um, are there any other countries or languages kind of grappling with with the issues presented with having a gendered language or, or, or is the U.S. leading that or are there other countries further ahead on us in that conversation and then taking steps like creating more inclusive terms like Latinx? Mario, I love the term only in America. <laughs> 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 this is really this is really driven by Americans at this point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. These are not conversations that are being held around business meetings in Latin America, Latin American owned business companies. Now well, the multinational companies that are based in the United States who may take that to Latin America. You know, that that's another conversation culturally. Yeah, but I mean, even, even outside of Latin America, though, I was just thinking, you know, like you met, you know, I, it, it's not a conversation in Italy. Yeah. It's not a conversation in Russia, for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a conversation in Germany, you know, where you have other gender based languages. Very interesting. But but to me, that makes sense, right? Because there's no other country with the level of multicultural ethnicity variety that we have in the U.S. So do, do we think that's the that's the. That's the X factor over here in terms of the, of the U.S.? You know, I don't take positions on these things. I just study culture, right? Look at what's happening, so I'm, I'm just trying to answer the question. I think that the United States is a very unique, uh, it's a very unique country. You know, there are some other countries like like Great Britain right now that have this amount of diversity. There's a great amount of diversity in India, right? But the conversation in India is around other languages, like, you know, do we use Farsi or do we, you know? And, and so it's a different conversation, right? I, I think sometimes people in America feel like we're kind of the center of the world, right? <laughs> but there are 1.3 billion people in India, you know, and they have like four times the populace we do. And, and so it's just, I, I, I try to, see things from a different lens in, in, in my world of, of just studying and understanding. David, you want to chime in? Um, sure. Well, I think, I mean, so again, I, I don't come from the business perspective, more with nonprofits and activists. So, I mean, when we're speaking in Spanish, I mean, a lot of 
the folks who are with here, you know, grew up in Latin America, speak Spanish. So we have our meetings, you can speak in English or Spanish. Um, when we talk also with activists from Latin America, I mean, I think you see here the with the E, uh, as I was mentioning, when folks are speaking in Spanish, they use an E, not an X, like when they're speaking in, in English. So um, it's just, again, about inclusion, no matter if you're speaking in English, Spanish, um, there's different movements. I think before feminist movements, now there's some LGBT movements, you know, testing different ways with language to be inclusive. And I think, you know, what sticks and what will be here in 15, 20 years, you know, we'll see. I feel like the at symbol, the robot really didn't stick that hard. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see. But I also have never, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't heard folks be like, you have to identify this way. And I don't think people either identify just one way. Um, because I might say I'm Latino, I'm Latinx, I'm Mexican American. I can be all these things and identify in all these ways. So, um, you know, as Julie says, that different governments made up different terms, different ways to describe language and who we are. And I think how people want to identify themselves, you know, is fine and we shouldn't um, force it on someone. I think as nonprofits, we'll be leading with inclusion, setting the tone. You know, businesses, I think, are coming from a much different angle, right? And probably going to base their decisions and market research based on what population they're trying to speak to at that time in that particular communication. Can I follow up on what David said, Giovanni? Yeah, please, go ahead. So, so if you'd pivot this to business, right? Let's take the Hispanic world or Latin world or Latinx world, whatever one wants to call it. You know, if someone says to me, I want you to consider me Latinx, I'm happy to do so, right? That doesn't, that doesn't take anything away from me. That's what they want. I'm happy to do that, okay? If that becomes the dominant term, so be it. Culture will dictate that, right? But if I'm a marketer, I'm a CMO of a Fortune 500 company, and I want to reach, let's say, Puerto Ricans, which, by the way, I would like you to call me Puerto Rican. I don't want to be called Hispanic. or I, I call me Puerto Rican. That's what I am. Okay. Um, that's a very different marketing approach than, say, marketing to people from Guatemala. I mean, we're from how many different countries? 22 different countries? So even though we have a common language, we have very distinct cultures. And to lump us all together into this kind of homogenous type of language or approach to us, I think is a mistake. I, can I add to that? I think this is such a difficult issue, right? When thinking about addressing people from the lens of internal to my company, well, let's say hola, hola members. Um, for me to say, sometimes I have to say Latino, Latina, <laughs> Latinx plus Hispanic. And I'm like, it's just so hard to like bucket all of us into one, one terminology. But also I do recognize that sometimes using Latinx is not necessarily as inclusive as I want it to be. So sometimes by me saying, you know, hola, the Google Latinx community or whatever, it's excluding a lot of people that really, really don't want to be identified that way. I just feel mm -hmm. like in, it's understanding the nuances of how, um, how individualistic self-identification is. And for me as a person trying to speak to a mass, Picking a term that will bucket all of us is just so difficult. I'm just going to start saying, hi, hola, humans, or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and, and, and Ricardo, who listed, like, those points are, you're, you're spot on, right? And I think ultimately what it goes to, right, is, is um, the imperfectness um, or really the construct of race and ethnicity, right? Because... Mm -hmm. Outside of gender, now um, you look at intersectionality. You look at Afro Latinas, Afro Latino. Um, you know, the, from from from, and David's right, right? From a marketing perspective, it's a very different thing when you're trying to reach as many people as possible. Um, but I do think that there is um, a push in marketing, and and personally, I think it's great to be more specific, right? Because we're starting to see 
people are getting much more savvy and sniffing out inauthenticity. And, 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 and the more authentic you are in terms of reaching your consumer, whether you're Puerto Rican, I, for example, I, I, you know, I, I identify as Mexican American. Um, and um, I think the more that companies and nonprofits for that matter and government organizations understand their consumers and, um, you know, more specifically target, um, an interesting thing happens, right? The more specific you are, I mean, you think about content, right? I mean, thinking about Netflix or any kind of movie, the more specific a movie, um, it has this an interesting phenomenon where it becomes more universal. Um, and, and I think I think that's what's starting to happen here when we when we talk about that. We're we're butting up against the 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 realization that that race is an, and, and ethnicity is an imperfect construct. And it's hard to encapsulate that with with words. We've, we've done Go ahead. All We've done a lot of work in the construction and manufacturing um, industries in development of leaders, Latino leaders within within those organizations on a, on a national scale. And when we first go into a company, it's very difficult to see a group of Mexicans having lunch with a group of people from Guatemala, right? And so you're, you're, mm -hmm. you come into this stark realization that, you know, or you get Costa Ricans together with Nicaraguans who have been at war together, right? And, 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 and you come into this realization that we are not one big happy group of homogenous people because that's our reality as whether we call ourselves Hispanics, Latinos, Latinas, Latinx, whatever moniker we wanna put on ourselves, the reality is we're from 22 different countries. And if you add the US 23, and you know the US is the third largest Spanish speaking populace in the world. And our, our economy is I think you had it in your data there, uh, Giovanni. If we were a country, we'd have the seventh largest economy in the world right now. It's amazing what Hispanics are doing in the, in the United States. I think we shouldn't get lost in the, the little letter or word we call each other and let's let's leverage our unbelievable potential. We shouldn't get lost in this. So I think that's really a good transition there, Ricardo. I, I, you know, I, I really wanted to start this dialogue with that cultural terminology of Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, because our audience uh, uh, has a craving for this, very much like, you know, they reacted to Mario's article. Uh, I know that a lot of the folks in this webinar had a craving for this as well. But uh, overall, right, it's kind of like you said, this is only one aspect of the U.S. Hispanic. What other insights uh, can you guys as panelists, can you provide about the U.S. Hispanic market here in the U.S. And Mario, maybe you will be a good start. I know you had a really powerful example regarding the car manufacturers. Maybe you'd like to share that with us. Yeah, yeah. So um, what Giovanni is referring to, we did a really great study and because um, Giovanni was asking me to share a story that encapsulates what we do at Think Now. Um, and I can share the study because it was it was a, a published study, Honda uh, won an award for the marketing campaign that they created based on some of the insights that we helped them with. Um, and, and in short, what we did, we did some work with them uh, regarding um, truck ownership among Latinos in the US. Um, and for those people people that don't know, you know, Honda is one of the top brands consistently among US Hispanics. Um, they, they've invested a lot of marketing dollars and time um, and, and creating that relationship. Um, and uh, another stat in regards to automotive is that um, Latinos in the US are one of the top uh, purchasers of, of pickup trucks. However, um, you know, Honda wanted to understand they have a pickup truck, the Ridgeline, um, that wasn't resonating with Latinos. And, and you would think mm. that being a top brand among Hispanics, um, that, you know, buying their truck would be a, a natural extension of that. So. We did some work around not necessarily why they weren't purchasing the Honda brand, um, but more about you know what is it, what is behind this uh, trend of uh, Latinos over-indexing in pickup trucks uh, purchase. Um, and so we did some some online qualitative research, um, followed it up by quantitative research, and what we found 
in the qualitative portion when we were having discussions was that um, if you think about, um, you know, you think about kind of the general market, um, one of the things that most people dread owning a pickup truck is getting that phone call like, hey, are, are, are you available this weekend? I'm moving, right? I mean, you, you talk to most people and you're laughing because like, you know, you, you don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be called or that girl. You don't want to be called. Um, I've made that call a couple of times. Move, right? <laughs> um, but in our research, what was really interesting is that we, we found the opposite was true for U.S. Hispanics. They one of the reasons that they purchase pickup trucks is they like being that person and their friend and family group to help out. And this is not necessarily about moving, um, to help out in general, right? Pick up a large item. Um, they like being the go-to. And what that points to is an aspect of culture, right? To Ricardo's point about um, collectivism, right? That that is something that that does unite Latino culture, right? This idea of collectivism versus individualism in the U.S. And that plays itself out very differently in the U.S. among U.S. Hispanics generationally. But even when we look at second, third generation, bicultural, bilingual, English dominant Hispanics, there is remnants of that collectivist culture. Um, and, and Honda used that insight and created a really great campaign around being that person in the family and friend circle that was the go-to. Um, so I, I know that's a little bit outside of the conversation uh, in terms of terms, but I think it does point to a solution about, um, you know, not necessarily making it a term-based outreach, but, you know, looking at what, what unites us from a cultural perspective and using that versus terminology. I love that. It's just beautiful. Can can I jump in? I'm, I'm gonna follow yeah, up. Please. I'm gonna follow up on David. So in the world of culture, it's called high context culture. So that in in the high context culture, as opposed to a low context culture, which mainstream U.S. is low context, but a high context culture is a culture that is driven by relationships. The relationship is more important than the result, right? And and so. But one of the things about high context culture is people get their sense of self identity through the group. Thus, I want to be the go to person, right? Because not am I, I'm not helping you, you're helping me. You're giving me a sense of identity because I'm my DNA as a high context person or in a high context culture is I need the group. I need the group. By the way, the antidote to gang activity uh, among these high context cultures is better groups. The reason that people get into gangs is because they're not properly connected to other people who can really be good for them. And so they get, they're still gonna to connect to the group. So I, I, in my consulting with police forces, I've always said to them, if you wanna do proactive work, just simply create better groups, it beats the heck out of prison, right? Mm -hmm. And and so I, I think that in some ways we, we've got it so backwards, but where that leads, I, I'll, I'll stop with this, is if you look at the leadership model uh, within the U.S. business environment, uh, it's typically fairly hierarchical, right? So if you look at an org chart, it's, you know, CEO, and then you've got your C-suite, and then you've got your vice presidents or presidents, and then vice presidents, and you do so on and so forth, right? We found in our studies and in our work with Latinos in manufacturing and in construction that a lot of times the best people who were suited to be leaders didn't want to be leaders. Mm. We started studying this in depth. Here's what we found out. They would say to us, I don't want to be a leader because I got to go back and I got to live with these people. And what they were essentially saying to me is, you're taking me out of my group. Well, that's where I get my sense mm -hmm. of identity. So what we did was we recalibrated the entire leadership experience and we started telling Latinos, OK, we're doing away with this hierarchical and this is a hub. You just happen to be at the center of the hub and you're making the wheel move. And when we started positioning leadership in that language for Latinos, it was like, let me in. A, a full, and I think that there's insight there for corporate leaders, uh, especially for people maybe who are in the labor sector. Well, I think you, you both have provided a fantastic insights into the, his, into the Hispanic cohort. Uh, Julissa and David, maybe you, do you have any other insights that you want to share? Julissa, I saw your hand out. Yeah. 
Yeah, I wanted to share that from the perspective of the ERG. Um, what we do for Ola is we call ourselves Ola, the Google Familia. And then when you look at the, our three pillars are cultivating leaders, cultivating familia, and extending Google's reach. So even within the way that we position ourselves, ourselves in the company, we focus on cultural values that we have as Latin people. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, no, nothing at this time to add this one, but some great. Has the Hispanic Federation um, uh, tapped into any key uh, topics that they're tackling on as, as an organization for the U.S. Hispanic? I mean, right now, I mean, right now we're really focused on, on COVID relief, of course. Um, so we started a fund with Lynn Manuel Miranda, who has been uh, raised about $11 million so far. So we provide capacity building support to Latino nonprofits. We also have a minority business initiative with Hennessy and uh, we have direct cash assistance. So we're really looking at, I think, um, if you look at Latinos in mixed status families, some who might be undocumented, some who might not be documented, the federal government included, excluded um, families who were US citizens from receiving um, stimulus money if one person in their family wasn't a documented status. Um, so there was a lot of folks in need of these other supports that weren't being provided. So we have direct cash assistance programs helping with um, rent, with housing. Um, so that's really been our focus right now during COVID. And I think just bringing up with different um, late night talk show hosts and folks to be thinking about Latinos and particularly in New York where it was hit really hard as our headquarters, um, how Latinos have been affected, what investment, um, are we making, but also thinking about what institutions and problems were there before COVID and how those kind of been brought to light that we might need better policies to be more inclusive of certain folks in federal programs or other safety nets um, in society. And we really work with Latino serving nonprofits to make sure that they're equipped to help serve those most vulnerable populations. Um, we do it through federal advocacy with the government, state advocacy, as well as capacity building and direct service. Gotcha. And I'll ask this question before I transition to questions from our audience. Uh, we have about 112 audience members who will join us for this webinar. I'll ask you if you have any questions uh, to any of our panelists, uh, please put it in the chat box. Uh, maybe start with the name of the person you'd like to address it. That make it, makes it easier for me to read. And then uh, I'll see how I could carve out some time here to, to address all your questions. But before we transition to that, uh, I'll pose this question to you guys. Uh, we're in 2020 already, right? Let's fast forward 20 years from now, maybe 30 years from now, 2050. What does a U.S. Hispanic population uh, look like? What will be the major topics of interest? Are we going to be debating Latinx in 2050? <laughs> or maybe something else? Think, think, think about it. What input can you guys give us in terms of uh, where are we heading, uh, and what does the future in the, of the U.S. Hispanic look like? I I, I can kind of take that from a to start off from a demographic perspective. Um, so I mean, as a multicultural marketer, and and I'm sure you know many people on this board know the stats, right? Hispanic are, are the largest, uh, my you know minority group in the in the U.S. Asian Americans are the fastest growing, um, and I think a statistic that that's not really talked about is that mixed mixed race is actually the fastest growing um, demographic. When you look at, yeah. I mean, um, you know, Gen Z um, has a, has a, you know the highest mixed race percentage we've ever seen in this country. And another stat that that that's kind of underreported is that U.S. Hispanics are the most likely. Um, to, to intermarry and have, you know, and, and, and be a mixed race. Um, and so I, I think that's going to really define the U.S. Hispanic population. And I alluded to that earlier in terms of intersectionality, right? Afro Latino, um, you know, Hispanic, Asian American. Um, I think it's going to again poke holes in this race and ethnicity construct, right? Because if you start to look at, um, 
influencers, young influencers on TikTok, Instagram that are interracial, um, many of them identify with both cultures, right? And so you, you talk about you talk about complexity with just US Latino and 22 country of origins, you know, now throw in interracial, um, it, it's, it's gonna be really, really complex. So um, I think for me, that's gonna be one of the defining characteristics is, is uh, you know, kind of mixed race, mixed culture, um, bilingual, tri-culture, right? Um, you know, looking at my family, my, my wife is Sri Lankan, my kids are Sri Lankan, Mexican, American, right? I mean, how are they gonna identify? Wow. Um, so it, I, I, you know, that uh, it's, I'll, I'll keep you posted. They're six and four right now. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That, that just goes into this, this is Giovanni knows this. I mean, it just underscores the absolute need within our society to develop a cultural healthy, a culturally healthy mindset and skill set. If, if the, if in masses, our people do not become culturally healthy and skilled. Our country will be in significant, you know, we're seeing it, right? And obviously this is not just a Hispanic thing or it's not a multiracial thing. You know, we're, we're having incredible tensions in our country right now racially, but racism is a symptom of a deeper cultural dysfunction in our relationships, right? And so if we continue just to simply address the symptoms, we'll never get to the root issue and we'll never really heal. And I think that there has to be a time now where we get serious about developing ourselves as it relates to our cultural mindset, and that is how we view one another, which would then in, in turn address things like bias and stereotype and prejudice and all of these things, and also our skill set. When we talk about cultural skill set, it's how do we connect with one another? How do we create together? How do we collaborate together at the highest levels? And very honestly, we just don't have these skills. I, I, Mario, I love the fact that you have so much data. We've run a lot of data recently with leaders. On, in fact, we did this with Giovanni's group on cultural health and skill. And we haven't had a group of leaders yet on a scale of one to 10 test over six as it relates to cultural health and skill. So this I think has to be our next main significant movement. Multiculturalism is here. Diversity is here. Those things, are not in question any longer. What's in question is, will we develop the cultural health that we need? Will we develop the skill set and the mindset we need to be able to bring ourselves to our highest potential? That's what's in question. I think to that point, Ricardo, like my, me, myself, I identify as Afro-Latina. And to know that to, today, and I'm a technical female at Google, um, I don't see myself represented, even though our population is growing significantly. So my hope is that as we grow, um, that we band together and not divide, and that we start, you know, going into these spaces where Latinos aren't at still in 2020. Um, that is my hope for us in the future. I think that's beautiful. And uh, I also think along those lines, just with a lot of the young politicians being uh, elected these days, you know, there's Afro Latinos, there's um, LGBTQ Latinos, there's a whole spectrum of folks, as, as Mario mentioned, with all these intersections of identity. And I think it's really encouraging to see these young folks and more women taking up leadership in our country. So I'm excited to see what folks do, seeing more Latinos, Latinas, Latinx gente in all these positions, you know, across the government and thinking, what policies do we have to support Latinos to support the success as um, of all Americans, of immigrants, um, of treating all you know human beings with dignity and respect? And I think part of that is you know electing our folks as well to make decisions and be at the table. Thank you to all of you for sharing your thoughts. We're not going to pivot in the next twenty minutes to questions from our audience. Again, if you haven't had an opportunity, use the chat box to put in your question there. Feel free to put in the name of the panelists if you'd like me to address it specifically, and we'll do. We'll spend the next 20 minutes doing that, and at the end, we'll spend the last 10 minutes uh, allowing our panelists to share with us their final thoughts as they think about the U.S. Hispanic insights. So the first question, um, I think this uh, this might be addressed to you, to you Lisa. 
where should ERGs direct their efforts during the next few years? I mean, are we, should, should they be more focused on educating our leaders? Are we considering um, uh, the labor to be an issue that need more, that need more massaging, more explanation, or is this something that we just let organically happen? Um, okay, so where do I think that um, we should move forward uh, within the ERG is we do need more education. I think right now with everything that's happening in our country from the Black Lives Matter movement to COVID to our political climate, I do think that there is an opportunity for us to address colorism if we're talking about Latino ERGs. Um, and, and I think ERGs play a really important part in um, being, bringing forward those conversations on a national and global level. Um, I also feel like as ERG leaders, we do a lot of cultural events and a lot of soft events. We need to focus more on the professional development and seeing how we can cultivate um, professional workshops that are catered particularly to Latinos. I know Giovanni, you went through the ACER program. Um, and I, for me, as going, going through that program, it was a revelation. I've never been talked to in that way that use my cultural relevance and my cultural knowledge with my professional knowledge, professional re relevance and put it all together in one training. I feel like we need to do more of that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Another question that I got here is, um, it, it, it seems that we focus in highlighting divisive topics. What are the topics that unite us as a community? I'll jump in. <laughs> family unites us, our, our, our view of the closeness of family. Our language unites us. It, it's in some ways it's unfortunate that we have one word that we're divisive about with one another when we have an entire language that actually does unite us right um our entrepreneurship right now unites us mm. you know we are we are far and away the largest growth sector in the united states there are more female, you know, Latina women who are starting businesses right now than any other group of people. And, and so I won't even say Latinos because it is the women that are starting all these businesses. They are empowered right now, right? So entrepreneurship, um, the greatest rise in home ownership in our country is among Spanish speaking people or Latinos or Hispanics. Now I'm confused, Giovanni. You know, and and so we we are united by this this desire to prosper together. That's the one you know. So the sense of passion that we have for life as well. You know, we like to have a good time, man. <laughs> you know, that's a good thing. You know, so many people right now are negative. We're stuck, but Latinos know we keep on partying. You know, and it's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, in fact, often that's what I warn ERGs about, right? Be careful with the three Fs, fun, food, and flag. You know, if we, if we, if we just make events about fan, food, and flag, we'll, we'll, we'll tend to miss the greater opportunity, which is around connecting with others, sharing that culture, you know, professional and personal development. Uh, and, and, you know, my advice has always been include the food, fun, and flag, no doubt about it. Again, add this older layer of, of, you know, that's a little more business focused, a little more business minded so that you attract a greater crowd. So re really, really good insight there. Um, let's see. So, uh, okay, I think, I, think, I think, Ricardo, you sort of addressed this earlier, and, and it was the concept of, so, you know, if, if you were advising a C-level executive, about the trends of U.S. Hispanic, right? And you, 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 you specifically addressed that. Did anybody else want to chime in in that concept? If you had a, if you were in a personal advisor to a C-level executive, and you were to say, "Hey, this is what you got to pay attention at the school," what would you say to them? Uh, 
David, I'm, I'm going to jump in. David, you want to go? Go ahead, Ricardo. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling space. So. Go ahead. The best study that I have ever come across on niche marketing to our people was President Obama's first presidential campaign. And if you haven't seen this, he takes this one song and he puts it into mariachi. He puts it into Tex-Mex. He puts it into reggaeton. He puts it into, and it is the most, if you put it and piece it all together and the, the genius, the genius of it was this uncanny ability. I don't know who his advisors were on that. It wasn't me, so I'll, I'll be upfront on that. Um, <laughs> but it was genius. And it was key. Right. And if you listen to this, it was just and I and I, I did a study on this and I actually used to, used to present on this. I think it's the absolute best study of niche marketing within our community. And I would just recommend everybody go out and find these music videos of, of what President Obama did in his first presidential campaign. It was, it was pure genius. I, I did not know that. I'm going to have to do this after this. <laughs> Maybe for, for 2000 pesos, I'll send you that directly. See, that's just Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I had another question popped in here. How important is it for business leaders whose primary language is English to learn Spanish as a second language in order to attract and connect with the Spanish speaking community? Mario, do you have any data that shows any trends? I mean, I, I, I can answer it from a marketing perspective. I think there's other people on the board here that could, from an ERG kind of human resources perspective, um, could better answer that. Um, I mean, so you qualify the Spanish, you know, to connect with the Spanish speaking population. I mean, it's extremely important, right? Um, for, for marketers and brands to speak to, um, to Hispanics and, and, and Spanish if they're Spanish dominant. Um, you know, I, I mentioned kind of trends and uh, happening in the U.S. U.S. Hispanic market. I mean, another trend is um, uh, the importance of, of speaking Spanish um, and identifying as Hispanic or Latinx is is dwindling, right? And and that's um, and Ricardo can probably speak to this. I mean, from a cultural perspective, that's that's something that we've known, right? Um, as you start to get second, third generation, um, as you start to get, um, you know, more more races, more languages, um, English is becoming the dominant language. So, um, you know, while we do share a language, um, you know, I think it is becoming overall, and as you go into younger cohorts, less important from a marketing perspective. Um, that being said, we do, if, if we look at Spanish speakers in the U.S. I think Ricardo said we're second or third. Um, if we were a Spanish-speaking nation, second or third. So there's a huge, large percentage of the U.S. Hispanic population that speaks Spanish. And if that's your target audience, it's extremely important to speak Spanish. I, I remember uh, Mario, you uh, one of your reports talk about how younger Latinos are being digital sherpas to order Latinos. Can you explain that concept and provide that insight? Yeah, so, so the idea of um, Digital Sherpas, uh, we actually partnered with Ninth Wonder a Agency. Um, this was a concept uh, termed by a great marketer, Maria Tuena, at, um, at Ninth Wonder. Um, and this idea came that she had many brands coming to her and saying, hey, we're, we're, we're spending money on uh, Spanish language advertising. Um, but all the traffic that we're getting is coming in from from uh, our English language website. Um, and so oh. they use that data to um, to cut Spanish language advertising online. And Maria had a theory that, well, um, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I, that that you should be cutting back on Spanish language advertising because she theorized that um, Spanish speakers are looking at these ads and then asking family members, younger family members to purchase it for them who are English dominant. And so we actually just completed a study um, last month that quantified that and her theory was in fact correct that um, a large portion of bicultural, bilingual 
um, Hispanics in the U.S. are purchasing products online for older family members that are Spanish dominant, both in the U.S. and 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 their home countries. Um, and so it, it went, and and all of us that have you know Spanish speaking relatives can probably relate to that, right? We we've we've likely if we have a Spanish speaking relative have purchased something online. Or maybe if it's not even purchasing, research something um, for a relative that 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 um, that isn't comfortable purchasing things online um, in English. Um, and so it's it's a really great study that points to the collectivism too, right? In terms of um, 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 helping out um, friends and family that are Spanish dominant. Anybody else want to chime in? I'll just say one thing on, on the issue of language. There, to me, there's one base question that somebody should ask themselves. And that is, do I want to connect with the heart? The first language, the native language, is the heart language. That's where I can get my deep, deepest connection with another person. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to connect with Spanish-speaking people that their first language is Spanish, then, then the answer to that question is yes. If you don't, then the answer to that question is no. It, it's a mm -hmm. very simple question to ask yourself. Um, by the way, it's just, just as a side note, there are more first language Spanish speaking people in the world than there are first language speaking English speaking people. So mm -hmm. we, we have to recognize how important this language is to the world economy. And even though a lot of Latinos do speak English, it's still, it's still the soul for a lot of people. It's it's still pulling on the heartstrings, huh? And Absolutely. that reminds me, when, when I get emotional, the Spanish comes out, man. The Spanish comes out. <laughs> Why <are> you? <laughs> you cry in Spanish now. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, somehow the Cuban comes out, even though I've been in this country already for 20-something years, you know? Mm -hmm. It still comes out. It's there, you know? So um, I do have one more question here. Uh, it seems like the trend is to add more and more labels I, I, I'm assuming that what they're saying is, you know, Latino, Hispanic, Latinx, you know, Afro-American, you know, it's, so as, are we, is the trend to add more and more labels or to consolidate into one universal label? What are the trends that you guys are seeing? I think it's consolidation, or it, at least for me, um, identifying as Afro-Latina, it has to do with acknowledging parts of my upbringing, my culture, my ancestry, that the term Latino itself doesn't because of the racial complexities within our countries. Um, I don't think it's just people are, you know, making up all these terms for the heck of it, I think it's more people are trying to find in these very broad terms, some kind of um, identity. Like they just wanna I fully identify with something. Does that make sense? David, is, is identity fluid? I'm sorry, couldn't you hear that last question? It's, it's identity fluid. It's the concept of identity is a fluid. Is it a fluid? Uh, I mean, change? I don't know any studies per se, but I mean, I think in my own life, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I've used several terms to describe myself over time that have probably changed. Um, I think, you know, I think right now what's really cool is people are listening. So I know you referenced before that, that time of the tragedy of polls. I remember at that time, all the uh, national LGBT nonprofits organized like a, a group to ask Latinx leaders how to respond to this. What should they be saying about this tragedy? What should they be doing? And in that conversation, the activists from Orlando wanted to use the term Latinx. So actually all these mostly white led LGBT groups put out the joint press release. And I just thought that was really interesting that they were listening and asking questions. What does it mean? And I think this time on race is really important as well in our country, that people are listening and to those folks most directly impacted by something and really putting leadership there and, and how we respond. Um, so. I got one other question. 
too often Latinos are known as the silent minority. Can can you explain why? Are, are we know are we known as a silent minority? What is that? I'm the loudest in my anybody ever heard this? <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah, pretty I mean, vocal. Maybe, maybe they're they're uh, referring to. I, I think that's typically described in terms of our voting patterns. Mm. Oh. In, in the U.S., that's that's what I've heard it. Um, what was the question though? <laughs> that that two. Too often, Latinos are known as the silent minority. Why is that? Because historically, we haven't voted is the answer. I mean, um, that's in, in numbers, in, in numbers um, e equal to our, our, our share of the demographic in the US. Um, but I do think um, with the pandemic, um, you know, the, the current administration, um, the economic impact of, of those things. I mean, I think if if there's any time to wake up the silent majority from a voting perspective, I think this is the year. And I, I think what's also kind of going uh, campaigns, putting Latinos, Latinas, Latinx people in leadership, hiring consultants that are making campaigns in language. Uh, my organization, we don't support any candidates, but um, there's a lot of articles on Bernie Sanders' campaign it hired a Latino-led uh, firm to do there. So it wasn't like they were translating an English campaign later, right? But they started from the beginning talking about content. The same thing with voter registration groups. Are there Latinos? Are they investing in Latino-led, community-led, year-round building that community to get people engaged on civic issues? Um, so I think that's uh, kind of a powerful thought as well. And, and, having more of those voices included. Julissa, you had something? Okay, sorry. Ricardo? Yeah, I think I see it a little bit different culturally. First of all, we're the majority minority. Um, I don't think we're silent. I, I think that we, over the last 20 years, the impact that Hispanics have made on America is profound. Mm -hmm. And maybe we're not, or historically haven't been as activist, you know? It's interesting if you look at the U.S., right? So you had the Black experience primarily in the South and the East. You know, it was on the East. It didn't get west of the Mississippi. And so you have everything that has to do with slavery and, and injustice, because there's a great amount of injustice, social engineering, you had the Jim Crow, the, 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 the Crow laws, you had redlining, you had all that stuff, but it was primarily East Coast, right? And then when you got west of the Mississippi, it was the Mexicans, right? It's a total, it's almost like there are two different countries that happened at the same time. Hmm. And I, I think for me, we're all on this journey of really understanding right Not, none of us have arrived at a full understanding of all of these dynamics you know and I, I find it fascinating giovanni that abraham lincoln and benito juarez were really good friends and that if lincoln had not been assassinated lincoln was very much against the mexican-american war if lincoln had not been assassinated most likely the united states doesn't annex that entire territory it's a totally different wow. world right and, and so it's, it's, it's so, to me, I think that the whole thing is so fascinating, right? But I don't think we're silent. I think we're making a profound impact on our world, maybe just in a different way. I'm, I'm wondering if, if the, the reference here has to do with if, you know, if, when our community is offended, right? Or when our community, when somebody says something, uh, negative of our community or something happens and, and in, a social injustice happens to our community, do, do we organize uh, with the same capabilities as other communities in this country? Do we organize with the same effectiveness? Are our voices being heard and then being amplified with the same effectiveness as other communities in our country? Cesar Chavez was a pretty good organizer. You know? Yeah, he was. But that was what, 40 years ago? His impact was incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, has it been followed yeah. through? I mean, you have groups like, you know, David, you're part of LULAC, right? 
Um, I mean, not that there aren't major movements. David? I mean, I, I used to work for Lula. Yeah, now I'm with um, Hispanic Federation. But I mean, I think so. Dolores Huerta is still organizing, and what is she in her nineties now? I think so. Um, there's a lot of folks organizing, a lot of folks doing work. We're part of a coalition of 45 other Latino civil rights organizations, um, and we're putting out federal policy agendas. I think what's cool right now about our moment, talking about racial injustice and other injustices in our country, um, I think folks are starting to realize if you vote in your local city, if you vote in your state up to president, all of these really have impacts on who's in charge in your city and your interactions with different public officials. So, you know, I'm excited to see how can we be allies of the Black Lives Matter movement? How can we lift up those Afro-Latinx voices in our community? How can we understand that, that voting really makes a difference and, and what happens in your everyday life? So I think we got to continue, you know, those organizers before us and keep organizing. Every time I hear Dolores speak, you know, she's like, organize, 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 educate, each other and you know we got to keep doing that work community by community and Julissa, you you and i are part of ergs right i mean we are pretty active and pretty vocal in our respective ergs not only internally in our in our in our corporations but also in the external work that we do you know assembly has given over three million dollars worth of scholarships that's ex that's external work we've done over forty five thousand volunteer hours every single year that's external work so it's it's a it's a provocative question of how we're, we're the silent majority or not i was i'm almost leaning with mario in, in his assessment that this has to do with our voting um uh with our voting participation but but mario we didn't we didn't we came out didn't we break records on voting participation for hispanics this past in this past election cycle I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think it's been steadily increasing. I think I think what um, in reference though, it's just per percentage of the population, right, compared to to other groups. Um, and Ricardo is 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 right. We we are, we are making an impact, and there are states, counties that that the Latino vote um, definitely has moved things. Um, but I think just looking at overall percentage of of uh, of registered voters or Latinos that can register, it's still, um, you know, it's still still lower than, than projections. Okay. Well, folks, we got five minutes left. Thank you so much for all of those who are hanging there with us. Uh, I hope you find our panelists' insights uh, helpful. I hope they, they contributed with their knowledge, their wisdom uh, to your day today. And I want to give the next uh, four minutes now to each of the panelists to give us their final thoughts, and um, I don't want to. I don't want to pick one of you to go first, but do anybody want to go first? Lisa, go first. Me, hey, ladies first. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just I want to thank you, Giovanni, for putting this panel together. I think it's a really important conversation that I I think is on the top of a lot of people's minds. Um, I want to say that there is not one answer for moving forward with one term for everyone. And um, and I, but I do hope that at least today we were able to shine some light on the differences and nuances um, on the different terms and, and the intentions behind them. Thank you. How about you, David? Sure, well, thank you so much for having me and this great group of panelists. Um, I mean, I think just treating all human beings with dignity and respect, I mean, I think that's where we wanna be and where we wanna to go towards, including folks, supporting each other as human beings. And I think along that journey, there'll be a lot of interesting conversations and it'll be fun to watch and evolve and see what happens with language over to 2050, as you said. Yeah, Mario? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And um, great meeting everyone on this panel. It's been a great conversation. Um, I, think, um, I think it's, you know, Cultural competency, like Ricardo said, I think we could all, um, whether you're in business, nonprofit, um, you know, politics, government, um, we could all use um, some cultural comp competency to to navigate, especially what's happening now, um, and 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 inclusion for sure. 
Um, so, you know, read, we've done a lot of studies. We have a lot of free resources on thinknow.com. There's a lot of other studies, the work that Asemo is doing. Um, Google actually has some, has some great work on, on, on um, online behaviors, um, shopping habits. So, um, you know, consume research. Um, this is evolving. Um, and, I, and I think we could all, um, you know, benefit from that. Last but not least, Ricardo. Well, first of all, Giovanni, I celebrate you. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. You do this, right? <laughs> yeah, you got a point. You got a point. <laughs> oh, my. Um, we have to move beyond this kind of failed idea of cultural tolerance to cultural endearment. And there's a very specific process to get there. We have to transform our cultural mindset and our cultural skill set. It's time we move from cultural sensitivity to cultural skill. It's a difference, right? And our country is that kind of at a tipping point and maybe a breaking point. And we, we need to move beyond where we're at, but we have to transform who we are if we want to see in the aggregate real change. You know, all, all transformation happens internally. And, and one of the greatest lessons I learned in life working with leaders was uh, leaders who were culturally unhealthy and unskilled simply could never lead external tra in external transformation. They just weren't internally prepared to do so. So I think the real work has to start inside of us. That's with our mindset and skill set. And I just encourage everyone to just start giving some serious thought to, to really working on ourselves. Giovanni, thanks for putting this together. It was wonderful. Great panel. Yeah, and that's as your as your moderator and host, it's been my honor, it's been my pleasure. And I hope that this inspires and instigate more dialogues. Um, you know, it, it, don't bring together people that think alike. Bring together that have different perspectives. And always keep at the core of your framework that people are approaching all these different complex subjects from a place of honesty, from a place of authenticity. And if, you, if that's your framework, right, that would allow you to help you listen more acutely and more attentively to the other's perspective. And I think when we do that, we're going to find a lot of common ground instead of highlighting all the differences that do exist. We have more common ground than we have differences. I'm convinced about that, especially within our community. So thank you guys very much for joining us. We will uh, take this recording put it uh, on our different newsletters. And, 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 and if you have any, if you would like to see the report of the survey that we have, email me and we send it to you. Thank you very much, guys. Adios.